and really an extraordinary lady that would take this on. And, uh, and I just want to say personally, just take a quick minute to say thank you to Diane and Mitch and to Susan. And I also want to take a moment and thank Bishop Nathaney, the bishop of this church. You know, I'm embarrassed to say I've lived here eight years and never been in the sanctuary. We may attend this Sunday. It's a beautiful sanctuary. He does services at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, and we all be welcome and invited. But he's a guy that made this available to us, and he's been accommodating. Can we give a round of applause? You know, for a while, my wife, Sue, went over and helped Diane with some of the discovery documents. And what that involves is going through boxes of emails that would have been privileged information, but there's a lawsuit. So they are made public because of discovery. And my wife would come home so angry. And sometimes I thought she was mad at me, but she was mad at Clark Hobby or Jerry Mitchell or somebody, I don't know who, but somebody else, you know? And I just couldn't imagine what it was like for Mitch Kovernick in the environment of all that thing. They have a beautiful home, but a whole bar area that should be where you drink coffee and eat bagels is full of legal binders, full of all the research that she's done. And I'm telling you, it's truly amazing. And you know, the reason that I didn't discover any of this is because I was lazy and didn't care. I mean, just being honest with you. I cared, but not enough to do the work. You know, not enough to do the research. So I want to say our next speaker, and I promise you, if you think it's getting late, please don't leave. This is a riveting presentation, and it's unbelievable to make a hell of a movie. Sorry, Bishop, I said hell. Make a heck of a movie. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not even Catholic. I'm crossing myself. But, um, it would make a great movie because there is intrigue, there is espionage, there is all kinds of things, and it's really riveting. I want to introduce a man that has lived with this whole thing more than anyone else besides Diane Kovernick both figuratively and literally, Mitch Kovernick. Well, Steve, Steve, now, now I don't know if I can do it up to Okay, well, I'm here to talk about the golf course, but um, I actually am involved in another project, and I want to just, which I know is very near and dear to all of you, but, uh, and I want to just uh, say a couple words about that before getting into the golf course, and that's FGUA. Wait, I felt happy. That was supposed to be. That was supposed to be for me. Um, I serve on a committee that was formed to deal with the FGUA issue. Now, I work with Art Heidecke and Ray Williams, who are both Gulf Harbors residents. And there are a few other individuals from other communities surrounding uh, the Gulf Harbors that are also part of what used to be known as the Linger Water System. Uh, we've been meeting with county commissioners and our elected officials at the state level, both representatives and senators, to try to fix what is wrong with FGUA. I don't think I have to tell you what's wrong with FGUA. If anybody who lives here has received the water, but you know what's wrong with FGUA, so I won't go into that. Um, We've looked at various options, including maybe Newport Richie taking it over and so on, and the only real feasible solution that we've all been able to come up with is for the county to take over the water system from the FGUA and include us in the water system that the county already runs. They already run it. They have their own water department. There's no reason we have to be dealing with FGUA when there's another alternative, and that's what we've been promoting and that's what we've been lobbying for. Um, now, the county commissioners are very aware of the problems that we have with FGUA, and we've actually received some, some pretty warm, warm receptions from them. They know what the problem is, and they seem to want to help us find a solution. So I, I give them credit for that. Um, they have ordered an engineering study to be done on our water system, which will examine the infrastructure and, and the costs involved. And it also includes several other FGUA systems in our area. We're not the only ones. Uh, now that report is going to be completed, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks from now, around, around the 2nd of December. And when we get that, we'll be reviewing it. Um, but the fact that they've ordered that report is a great first step. And it just shows that we do have a possibility of, of cleaning up this Hugo mess. Uh, I would basically just look at this, the way I would describe it is cautiously optimistic. 
I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think we're making progress and we're going to continue to fight the fight. Now, the, just one little bit of background on, on FGUA is that the real hurdle that we have with this, uh, with this, with this, uh, with this issue is the fact that FGUA just paid way too much for the Linger system when they bought it in 2010. That's the source of all of our real problems, is we have to make up that debt service. Uh, when this deal was pitched to the community back then, the commissioner at the time, I think was Ann Hildebrand, um, she pushed for the community to vote for it. Now, I wasn't there, but we only moved in here in 20, the end of 2010. But I understand from other people that uh, the community was told that we had to vote to approve this sale to FGUA or bad things would happen, uh, particularly large rate increases from the prior uh, water system owner. Well, the sale was approved by a vote of the community, and bad things happened anyway. Probably worse than had the sale been defeated back then. Now, here's my segue. Does that issue sound familiar to you? We were told the same thing about the golf course purchase. Buy it now or bad things will happen. Let's not make the same mistake twice, guys. At least for the golf course, somebody stood up to oppose it. It's just a shame I wasn't around for the Fugo vote. get into the golf course. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already heard a lot of information that was put out uh, by, by, by those of us that are opposing the purchase of the golf course. But more likely, especially in the early days, you were really only hearing from those people that were pushing for the sale. Uh, since they really had better resources to spread the word. They, they had life on the golf, they had public meetings, they basically had the resources push their side of the agenda, and we have to scramble to try to make people aware of other issues that they need to be thinking about. Um, so in a minute, I'm going to actually let the parties involved in, in the uh, behind-the-scenes issues explain it in their own words, and I'm going to do that by reading to you what they have written. Uh, but first, just let me give you a little bit of an idea of what I think could possibly happen to this land. This may be a little bit repetitive, but sometimes saying things repetitively gets you uh, to think about it a little bit more, or in different ways. Now, I've heard people argue that if the county doesn't buy the land, a developer will build on it. Maybe multifamily housing, maybe Section 8 housing even. Now, to understand this concern, we have to make a distinction between what is possible and what is economically feasible. Those are two very different concepts. Now, I'm not going to go into all the reasons why I think this land can't be developed, but some of them include the fact that there are wetlands, the land floods, a secondary exit is required from the subdivision by code, and various other code and planning and development issues that would have to be dealt with. The county also signed a local mitigation strategy with FEMA in which they stated that development in our subdivision would be limited to repairs only. Now this document is used to determine the flood insurance rates for the county. So if the county ignored their representation, that's my phone, that's my it's not a word. I hope none of you were calling me. Um, so what I was saying was this document that they signed for FEMA, the, flood, the local mitigation strategy, is what FEMA uses to set flood insurance rates for counties. So if the county, if the current county, Pasco County, decided they were going to violate what they represented to FEMA about future development in the subdivision, I'm just not sure how that would affect our flood insurance rates for the future. Now they're already high enough in Pasco County. We don't need to be taking chances with that. Um, I've also heard an argument made that the commissioners could just do whatever they wanted, and if they wanted to allow development on the golf course, well, they could. Um, so let's just assume for a second that that were possible. I don't agree with that, but let's assume for a second that that were possible, and also assume that nobody stood up to contest um, to contest that if the commissioners said, yes, we're going to allow Section 8 housing, we're going to allow multifamily housing. 
Nobody's fought against it. Let's just say that that was a situation we were in, that they would allow it. Now, if, even if that were possible, if the commissioners allowed it, that only deals with one issue, which is, can it be built? It doesn't deal with, is it economically feasible to be built? Now, let's deal with that. Now, my degree is in engineering. And I thought I spent most of my career as a real estate developer. Now, one project that I built was an office building in Houston on the site of a car dealership. In this case, the soil was contaminated by underground storage tanks, and I had to remediate the site by removing all the contaminated soil, disposing of it in an approved landfill, and then getting a clearance letter from the EPA. Now, this was an urban location. It was, on, it was off of a freeway, very high value land. So the economics there were very different from the economics on the golf course. There, it really paid to do the remediation and build the building. But what that did was it gave me some very, in very important first-hand experience in dealing with building on contaminated land and what the costs could be. Now, for the golf course here, we need more testing. But based on what the samples have come back so far, if I assume that those samples are indicative of the rest of the golf course, and knowing what I know about the rest of the site, including the fact that we have to deal with wetlands, as a developer who's done remediation before and who's built before, I would not try to build multiple homes on this piece of land, even if you gave it to me for free. And frankly, it looks like I'm not the only one who came to that conclusion. Back in 2003, I think you, you heard about that earlier, a developer tried to build homes there, and he even got so far as putting together a site plan. But that project never happened. And as we've, as we've mentioned before, back then, home prices were a lot higher than they are now. And they couldn't make a go of it back then. So, I don't think it's going to get any better. Now, the Orsi Trust, you've also heard, has a first lien or a mortgage on the golf course land. Now, that loan is a default, and they have the right to foreclose. Now, what that means is they could just foreclose on it, and they would own that land outright, with no further liens. All the, lien, all the following liens that, uh, behind them get wiped out. So, they could go through the foreclosure, and they would own that land free and clear for nothing. Yeah, they put money into it, so that would be, you know, there's some cost, but they would own it basically for nothing. But they're choosing not to foreclose. Now, the Orsi's are developers. They've built property before, and they could very well develop that property. But apparently they don't want it. Now, guys, just use a little common sense here. The owner of the golf course has been trying to sell it at least since 2003. The fact that nobody has bought it yet ought to tell you something. Now, it may or may not be even possible to build on that land. We can argue that point. But to me, it certainly does not seem to be economically feasible. And that's why it's never been developed. 